slide, but I'm glad you're all here tonight. Um, I'm Belle Morian. I'm the programming director here at the McFadden Ward House. And um, we're just delighted to have you here tonight to hear um, our very talented Thomas Ashworth speak. But before we begin, I'd like to give you a glimpse into a few things. I always have to do my ad for what we've got going on here at the McFadden Ward because we've got really cool stuff here going on. Um, we will have our first ever outdoor garden event during the month of March, and it's, it's really cool. Um, the exhibit is called Soar, and it's all butterflies, and they'll be all out in the gardens, all kinds of different butterflies all over the place. Some will be flying, some will be um, out in the gardens. You'll see them everywhere. And um, it's a month-long display and throughout the campus, but we're going to kick off with a family day on March the 5th, which is Sunday. And um, from 11 to 3, and we've got um, these fabulous um, butterfly wings that have been created by local artists that we are, we're going to have in our gardens. They're big and beautiful. Then we will have the Sabine Natchez Ma Master Naturalist here. We'll have this really neat bug cart that's coming from the Houston Museum of Natural Science. Um, we've got um, all kinds of craft booths and live music, a picnic area. We've got a food truck coming. And the the cherry on top is we have these butterfly bicycles coming from a group called Bike Zoo out of Austin. And you, your kids or you can ride on the butterfly bikes with these folks. It's really fun. So we hope you'll come March 5th. Um, and then the museum is also going to host two fabulous movie, uh, music events for SOAR. Um, the, we're going to have the uh, Front Porch Dulcimer Group come, and we're also going to have um, the wonderful Night and Day Orchestra here, and we're even going to have Dancing Under the Stars with the Night and Day Orchestra, so that'll be fun. You don't want to miss that. And then, or you can just stop by and walk through the gardens and see the butterflies. So, um, April 20th is our next lecture, and that will bring Ivan Schwartz from Studio EIS in New York. And Ivan is the creator of many significant commemorative sculptures from American history that can be seen at the New York Historical Society, Gettysburg, Gettysburg National Military Park, President Lincoln's Cottage in Washington, D.C., just to name a few. Um, he'll share the process of designing these monuments and bringing these historical figures to life. So that should be pretty interesting. And as I'm always guilty myself, I'm asking you all to silence your phones before we start. And at this point, I would normally introduce um, Tony Chaveau, our wonderful director, but he couldn't be with us tonight, but he sent his comments, and so I will read those to you. Um, it says, before I introduce this evening's speaker, I want to acknowledge the Mamie McFadden Heritage, Mamie McFadden Ward Heritage Foundation and the museum's board of directors whose generosity ensures that all programming here at the museum is free and open to the public. Several of our board members are with us tonight. We'd like to thank Leslie Wilson, right here, Lane Wilson, um, and Martha Hicks, all here tonight. We thank you all very much. Um, this evening's lecture coincides with the opening of a new architectural exhibit we've got in the carriage house. It's called The Way Things Were. It's um, Texas settlers and their buildings, the 1860s through 1930s. The exhibit is courtesy of the Humanities Texas program, and it focuses on the family and community life of Texas settlers as reflected in the structures they built their vision of community and progress, and their accommodation to physical demands and economic realities of everyday life. It will be in our carriage house, and all you do if you'd oops, like to come see it is check in here at the Visitor Center, and we'll get you on over there. Complementing the exhibit are a number of items from our own collections, uh, items such as the original copper light fixtures installed on the balusters of the grand staircase, several of the roof's original copper finials, and one of the huge and heavy original uh, column capitals is displayed there. The exhibit runs through April 30th, and we invite you to stop by and enjoy it. As one walks through the McFadden Ward House, it is difficult not to be overwhelmed by the furnishings and objects on display. But if you were to remove all that, you would realize that architecturally, the house is also a marvel unto itself. 
In literally every room, there are details that beg the question, gee, I wonder how they did that. To solve at least a few of these questions is this evening's speaker, Thomas Ashworth. With more than 30 years of experience in the fields of architectural ornamentation and interior design, Thomas is here to share his extensive expertise in historic preservation, methods of creating historic plaster architectural ornamentation, that's a mouthful, <laughs> and provide a glimpse of a few of his completed restoration projects. So let's please welcome Thomas Ashworth. Hey, Bill. Does, do these lights go off? Yes. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. It's 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 nice to be here. I'm, in all my years in business, I've never ever been asked to do anything like this, so it's kind of a real honor. Um, I'm from Georgia. I grew up about an hour north of Atlanta, and um, you know Atlanta is a very very busy place like Houston is today. And I've been in Beaumont now, or, or here in Southeast Texas for 15 years and I must say it is probably the warmest most friendly place that I have ever been us mountain folk back in Georgia they're a little bit superstitious I guess because they didn't want you to know where their stills were kept kind of some of my families like that a little bit but uh, it's it's um, it's great to be here um, let's see here this is a I don't know where this is this is some house somewhere in Europe Europe is full of this stuff and when I went to Europe a few years ago I saw some of that stuff too um, what is architectural ornamentation ornamentation has been around probably since the beginning of time um, there's, we've always liked to decorate things and that's what 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 ornamentation really is is decoration um, we could see the Egyptians, for example, decorated their temples and their tombs and, and all of their things, um, just all through the history, through the Renaissance periods, um, through Europe, uh, even in Asia, Polynesia, the Mayans. They all, they all had their form of ornamentation, and back primarily in the European times, uh, stone and plaster. Uh, were in wood were the predominant uh, methods which they used. Um, I focus on the architectural aspects of, of interior design. Uh, I am not what I call a paint pillow and wallpaper person. I leave that to someone else. But um, uh, it's kind of a. I, I went to the University of Georgia to become a golf course architect, and I ended up uh, dipping my hands in plaster for a few years. Um, let me. I'm going to give you just a brief, I left my notes on my computer at work, so I had to type up some real quick ones here, uh, so I don't make, I don't want to get any dates wrong. Um, we could talk about just the history of architecture in Europe and around the world for hours if we chose to. Of course, uh, the first real classical architecture came out of uh, Greece and Rome during the Roman Empire. The first notable English um, architect was Inigo Jones and he lived from 1573 to 1652 so they were doing some pretty high quality work back in the 1600s uh, I've never been blessed to do anything that elaborate because I live in America where we like things kind of plain another architect was Robert Adam and he's perhaps had the greatest influence on English architecture uh, everywhere you go, you see his work, his style of work. I don't have to point it at it. I don't know why I do that. Very, very, very typical Robert Adams style. And he was an architect, and he built a lot of these country homes, which, you know, were probably 100,000 square foot houses. Um, so England is dotted with, with his work, and he left a great influence on it. He was... Um, highly influenced by uh, the Baroque architecture. He spent four years in Italy studying under some of the architects there. And then one of my favorite people is Grinling Gibbons, and he is perhaps the finest woodcarver ever to have existed during that, those times. He was also, let's see, he was, Robert Adam lived in the uh, early 1700s, well, he lived through the 1700s, and Grinling Gibbons was 1648 to 1721, but Nobody carves like Grinling Gibbons, or hardly anybody carves. 
he carved some of the most amazing things and he worked for the king of england very exclusively he's done a lot of work in homes like uh, in um uh where was it he had done it um windsor castle st paul's cathedral big important places like that so the two mediums that i work primarily in are plaster and composition ornament uh what is plaster this is a photograph of the plaster mines in Paris, which is why we call it Plaster Paris. Professionally, we don't, but when you go to Hobby Lobby, they'll say Plaster of Paris because it, it evolved from Paris. And in 1254, um, King Henry III went to Paris, and he saw these beautiful, thin, smooth white walls that he had never seen before. And he figured out how to get people to come to England and start doing plastering there. There are primarily two types of plaster, lath plaster, which is what you put on walls, and the ornamental plaster. Um, I don't think back during those periods, um, plaster was a glamorous job. It was even up through the 1940s and 50s here in America. It was a trade. You know, you put on your whites and you went to work. Um, of course, they didn't have rubber molds hundreds of years ago, so most of the stuff was sculpted in place. That's called parge. They would mix up a batch, throw it on the ceiling or the wall, and the sculptors would carve out the details. Um, that's what plaster looks like in its modern state. Most of the plaster is mined in the, in the world is mined either in Korea or here in the United States up in Oklahoma. Um, it's derived from the m mineral basinite and then they pulverize it, and then they cook it at about 250 to 350 degrees. And then when I get it, it comes in my big bag, and I mix water with it, and it becomes very soft and malleable, and it starts curing, and I can pour it into molds, or I can form it into shapes. And then after about 30 to 45 minutes, it becomes hard, and it cures. It gets very, very hot, and that's the curing process that makes it very strong and durable. So... Um, I'll take you, this, uh, when, when, when did ornament really come to America? And I don't really have an exact answer on that. I think it was kind of simple at first. This is the Merchant's House in New York City. This house was built in 1832. And this is sort of a Beaux-Arts style. It's also a little bit of an Italianate style. Um, I did not know about this museum. And one day I was watching this old house and they showed this medallion and ironically I have all the pieces for that medallion and there's two of them sitting over here on the table a friend had given me several years ago and I thought well those are nice pieces maybe I'll do something with them I didn't really think they matched but sure enough um, they're these are copies but they go way way back so ornament has been uh, in America for quite a while and of course through the 1840s and in through the 1880s it really kind of started to develop and take place of course, we get into the turn of the century. Movie palaces was one place. This is the Alabama Theater in Birmingham. Uh, Victorian houses were um, beginning to be ornamented. You had the great houses up in Long Island and Rhode Island and the Breakers, places like that. Uh, ornamentation was becoming alive. Um, probably a lot of the Europeans had come here. I know the Polish and the Germans and the Italians, a lot of them immigrated to America and brought their stone carving, wood carving, and, and plastering skills with them. Um, there's a picture of their console of their organ, the Big Bertha. And uh, not quite, our organ here is not quite, got as fancy a console as that, but that is also covered in composition ornament, which we will talk about. And, of course, here in Beaumont, we have several examples of a beautiful architecture here at the McFadden Ward House, the uh, cathedral here in town, the Jefferson Theater, and there are probably others, uh, lobbies of various downtown buildings and so forth. But uh, ornamentation is alive and well in a lot of different ways. This is the plaster shop at the Decorator Supply Corporation in Chicago, Illinois. I have worked with Decorator Supply for over 30 years. Uh, Jack Meingast is, uh, I consider him a true friend, just a, an incredible person. Um, I wanted you to see what a plaster shop looks like. You can see the floors are white because they're covered in plaster. 
And they have lots of molds and they have lots of casting tables. They have lots and lots of stuff too. Over 14,000 different items in their plaster and compo collections. That's a rubber mold, that's a urethane mold of one of their crown moldings and it's a, it's a thin rubber mold but it's being held in what we call the mother mold. So that's a plaster case and when you make a piece of plaster you would um, cover it in clay and then you would make a plaster case or a fiberglass case, remove the clay, put the case back down and pour the rubber into the void and that's how you create your rubber mold. And there's one of their artisans having pulled the mold or the, the casting from the mold. A uh, sample of artwork. Sculpture, you know, pla um, clay sculpture is, is a part of ornamentation. Um, we don't see as much wood carving for plaster work, but uh, there are a lot of companies here in the United States that have some very good sculptors. Uh, Cashy in Dallas, uh, Decorators got a good one. Um, Hyde Park and uh, Foster Reeves in New York City all have really good shops. This is the vault at Decorator Supply. It is it contains all of their composition ornament carvings. Those are all wood carvings that were carved by, according to Jack, the Polish, the Germans, and the uh, Italians. And they have about 12,000 of those carvings in those little containers. Um, this is a machine that makes composition ornament. Now, compo is a little different. Let me get a little. Of course, this is a piece of plaster, and you can hear it ring. Compo is very unique because it is flexible when it is fresh. Compo is basically like bread. It is a mixture of whiting, animal hide glue, molasses, glycerin, and other things. And when you take it and you put that mixture together, you stamp it. Then when you steam it, and I have steaming trays, and I'll take the fresh ornament and I'll put it on the tray for a few seconds, it activates the glues. Then I can stick that to the wall or stick that to wood and it will not come off. Compo is what you see on picture frames. Uh, you see a lot of the ornation, ornament, ornamental detail in picture frames. That's what compo generally tends to be. And that is their batch mixer that they make the compo with. And that's what compo looks like when it comes out. It's very, very hot. They put it in little batches. They let it kind of cool. And then this is one of the original carvings right there. And this is the mold which they make the piece out of. Um, they used pine tar for, for many years, but now they've kind of switched to urethanes, to the plastics. They're a little more durable. And pine tar is getting kind of hard to find. But um, they, they make a casting of that. And then after he puts it in a book press. Or this is a hydraulic press that they have. He stamps that under very high pressure. And when it comes out, it looks like that. And it's still very, very soft at this point in time. Oops. Doesn't want to go backwards. Oh well. And then uh, after it's cured for a few moments, uh, for a little while, then he takes a knife and he removes the ornament from the extra material and they recycle the material, heat it up, and stamp it again. They do that in about 600 pound batches, I'm told. And there is uh, one of their workers with one of their very finely detailed composition ornament boards patterns that they've done. Very, very fine. I've done not that pattern, but one very similar to it, and it is a hassle to work with. It is so fine, but it is beautiful. That's my dad, David Ashworth. Um, when I was at school, well, I was at school, the University of Georgia, studying landscape architecture, and my father worked for my grandparents. Um, he had been in the family business. He was an only child. He didn't really want to be in the family business, but he was kept in the family business. And um, my grandparents were getting a little elderly, and he didn't, he kind of thought he was going to take it over, but he really didn't really want it. But um, 
my parents had always, we lived in a very nice home and they'd always wanted to ornament it. And they didn't have a clue how to do that. My mom had lots of books on castles. And of course we went to the Fox Theater in Atlanta and was always mesmerized by the beauty of that theater. Um, in 1988, my mom saw an ad in Architectural Digest for uh, a seminar on composition ornament from the J.P. Weaver Company in Glendale, California. So for my dad's birthday, she flew him out there and he went back four more times. <laughs> and there's my mom up working on, on some ornament too back in early in the days. Um, <clears throat> when I, I had stopped college for uh, two years to go serve as a missionary for my church and when I came back, dad said, I'd like you to, to look at something with me. So he flew me out there with him and they had a design seminar. And I met the owner, and I, I didn't know what this stuff was. Wasn't really fully interested in it, but I was kind of curious. Plus, I'd never been to California, and I got to go to Disneyland, and it was going to be kind of a cool trip. And the, uh, the, the owner, Lena Tyler Cast, had some design challenges. And my dad just, he sat back and said, you have at it, because he knew I could design. And Lena, and he never told me this for six years, but Lena came back and said after the seminar, if you don't put him to work, I will. So uh, dad said, how about let's start this business. Um, I ended up closing my grandparents' business, and he and I starved for about five years as we figured out how to do this. This was the very first ceiling we ever did in a house in uh, North Atlanta. And uh, we were very fortunate to build some allies from, from that work. I am a designer. I'm a, I call myself an ornamental plaster. I loosely call myself an interior designer. But I am really just a designer. I am an artist, and I can sculpt a little bit, and I can do other things. But I am a designer, and that's what I do best. I am a kit basher. I am not, I don't go out and create things from scratch. I take other people's stuff and put it together in pleasing compositions. That's kind of how we built our business. We first started working with the J.P. Weaver Company. Uh, as we became successful, they became jealous and uh, started trying to steal our clients. So we quit doing work with them and have been very loyal to Decorator Supply for many, many years. This is a, uh, an overmantle in a house up in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, a bedroom ceiling corner design. This is all work I've done right here from, from, uh, from that work there on. It's all my work. So um, bedroom uh, corner. That room was 12 feet. That's a, how, uh, an old 1920s home in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They were going to tear it down and build four McMansions on it. And... Um, a lady saw it and said, I want it, and made her husband buy it for her at a very ex extreme price. But uh, he is a billionaire, so he could afford it. Uh, this is their dining room. And I designed this. And when I say I design things, I just look at what's already been done, and we come up with concepts that fit the space. Um, the medallion was run. I have the moldings for the centerpiece. The little band on the outside is Decorator Supply Compo. That's the ceiling. It was, they were starting to do some finishing work on it. I never ever see my work finished because by the time I'm done and they finish the rest of the house, I'm long gone on to other projects and usually people are kind enough to send me some pictures. But uh, that is one of my favorite projects I ever did and we spent six months working on that ceiling right there. The ornamentation around the outside, the wreaths, that is composition. The plaster ring, and there's a piece of that sample outside on the table there, and all the rest of it, we laid it all out, figured out the geometry, laid it on the floor, and bent the molds, and uh, were able to com complete the shape. This is a home in Atlanta. Um, the columns are from Carrera, or, or from Italy. The floors, all the marbles from Italy. We did the upper <coughs> bands there, all the composition ornament there. Now this is an interesting story, and, and this is where I really got to learn a lot. A client from Dallas called me up and said, um, I want you to design a refrigerator for me. And I was like, okay, I can do that. Um, 
But she said, it's going to be, I want it to look like an armoire. And she sent me this picture and some of her concept sketches. So I came up with, after many tries, we came up with that design right there. And that's what it looks like. It's the most expensive refrigerator in Dallas, Texas. If any of you want one, we start at $50,000. I... Uh, well, um, see, it does. It's a refrigerator. It's mounted. It's attached. I had to go to Tri Supply and learn about sub-zero refrigerators, and because I had never designed a cabinet to fit around a refrigerator, and I didn't. I, I can't afford a sub-zero myself. Um, but we, we figured it out, and I had a wonderful um, uh, carpenter that worked with us, and then um, a very good faux finisher that, that we found for the client. So we do all kinds of interesting things, but that is all hand-laid composition ornament that was laid on this uh, mahogany. It's, it's a mahogany cabinet. So that's one of my kind of unique projects. Oops. This here is um, a ceiling in River Oaks for a very um, prominent um, billionaire who built a big wing of an art museum recently. And uh, his wife had gone to Europe and she saw some beautiful ceilings and said, I want that in my house. And they have a big 15,000 square foot house that houses all their John Singer sergeants and their other artwork. The artwork's worth more than the house is and it's a 15,000 square foot house. Um, the interior designer laid out some designs, showed them. She said, yes. They ordered $20,000 worth of this material. It showed up, and the 75-year-old interior designer said, I don't know what to do. He called Jack at Decorator. Jack said, well, the finest guy in the country lives an hour and a half from you. I got the call. I went over there. I looked at his design, and I said, I'm sorry, but I am not putting that on that ceiling. I will not put my name with that. That is... It's bad. It just looked like it's stuck taking stuff out of the catalog. No offense to him because he didn't know how and was just trying to stick stuff on the ceiling. But he said, well, I got all this material. I can't order anything new. And I said, if you'll give me a week to just sit here on the floor and play with it, I will come up with something. So we, I sat there literally on the floor with paper and I took all the boxes of ornament out and I worked on it. And this is kind of what we came up with. That's the corners in the early stages of construction. The ceiling medallion. And there's my dad working. I actually flew, got, got him to come out here and help me. He was considered retired at that point, but I got him here. And the, the faux finishers were working on the medallion at that time. And that's the finished ceiling. And I was short one piece of ornament. So I made a mold of that one piece. So there's one plaster piece on that ceiling. The rest of it is composition ornament. The... Uh, the client loved it. The architect hated me for it. She did not want me in that house. She did not like me, and I was of no use to her. I guess so. Another one of our, 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 our beautiful ceilings we did. Sadly, the funny thing is this is a 35,000 square foot house, and the clients never moved into the house. After they built it, she said, I really don't want to live in this. So, um, and he spent over $30 million building it and it sold for about $6 million, which I've seen several of, of, of our properties that they just, they have money, they spend it, but they can't sell it for what they've got in it. It's just really hard to do. Okay, historic preservation. I have not done a lot of historic preservation because I like working in multi-million dollar new construction homes. <laughs> I don't like fooling around with old stuff. It's kind of a hassle. You never know what you're going to find, but um, I was invited to come down and redo the ceilings at the new Economic Development Center in Port Arthur. This is the old, I don't know if it was the National Bank of Port Arthur, I don't know what bank it was, but I was invited to come down and do that. And I'd seen the, the photographs of the original ceiling, and I wanted to put the original ceiling back up. But this was not a restoration, this was a remodel, and they would not let me do that. The capital over here was, there were uh, capitals that go through the, you can see the columns 
they had taken down all the ornament there. This is from the National Bank right there. So it's um, probably close to a, getting close to 100 years old. But this was the condition of the ceiling when I first saw it. The murals and artwork was just about gone. They had poked holes in it where they'd put the dropped ceilings in in the 1960s or 70s. Um, they had even actually built a second, just like, just like the building downtown, the, the bank building downtown, they had put a, a second floor in that space. They had done the same thing here. So they had to demo that. So um, I, I did lots and lots of work, but I'm gonna just focus here on the medallion here. Um, <clears throat> that's what I had to work with. And it was in really, really bad shape. So I got all the pieces apart, started cleaning them up, making molds as I needed to, kind of put it, it's just kind of a puzzle and you just kind of start to work it through. And then it started to come together and there it is uh, getting ready to be molded. And at, at this point I would come in and I would take my clay in a very about three eighths to a half inch and I would lay it, I would put a plastic bag, plastic over, over it not to damage the mold. And then we lay that clay on it and then I build a case on top of that remove the case, remove the clay, grease the model, and then we pour the mold. Um, that's, that's shellacked and ready to, to go through that casting process. There were the two halves uh, in their restored condition. And I didn't know what went in the middle because there was not a chandelier. So I decided um, to, to make a circle and put a star in the middle. And when I actually went back and looked at the original drawing, it was a circle with a star in the middle. So I had guessed right. Uh, yeah, I put a little star now. Their star was big, but, but we made a little star for it because I just took it off of the other molds. And then um, the painters hired some people who did the painting. I wanted to do the painting and the restoration of that, but uh, I didn't get along too well with the painter on that one. So. What type of paint? <sighs> they probably used acrylics. Uh, there was a couple of college students from Lamar. Um, before we started restoration, I had told them we need to block off all the artwork, document every piece of it, because when the plasters, the lath plasters get up there, they start smearing it on top of things, and you don't know what's really there when you go back to do the restoration work. But um, I really wanted to spend about a year up there working on that, but they wouldn't let me. And, uh, oops. Uh, let's just say, let's go back here one. Um, you see the, you see the lady there, they used to look like oil paintings and now they just, well, you've seen that artwork in Europe that that person restored. It's, it's not bad, but it, it is what it is. Um, and that was what the finished pattern looked like. And of course, all the white space you see had big crown moldings up there. And that's where they would not let me replicate it. And, uh, and I stole this from the newspaper. Thank you, Beaumont Enterprise. But uh, that's what the ceiling came out, and they painted all that green stuff. Everywhere you see that green dots, and that's where moldings should have been. But it's better than nothing. And the building is beautiful, and it's been restored. It's very modern inside now. As you see glass railings. I wish they had left these capitals up. They were just fabulous. Um, Let's see here, okay. This, back up. This is an overdoor. I was asked by a client to design a, kind of a miniature replica of the library at the Frick Museum in New York City. So he flew me to New York City and we met and the library there is much larger than this room. His library was 13 feet by 20 feet, I think. So I kind of had free reign to interpret it. This is composition ornament. All the wood, I designed the whole room. The um, wood is quarter sawn oak. That's what it looked like after it was finished. You can stain composition ornament. You can faux finish composition ornament. That's what the room looked like in its more finished state. He, he's a collector of 18th century art. Um, very, very old looking art, yes. Um, he handed me a piece of paper with a picture of a ceiling on it, and I replicated the very similar to what 
for what he wanted. There's some of the layers of the ornamentation that we added. I made the crown, the crown on the bottom, I fabricated myself and the top piece with the flowers and all that. Everything else, there's some plaster and decorator supply compo scrolls are there. And uh, oops. And there's my friend Jerry Ritterbeck. He's doing the faux finishing on the overmantel there. That's all plaster and epoxy because I needed something durable. And uh, I think she came out really, really well. And um, I look at that now and say, oh, I could have sculpted that much better. But um, I think it works. I think, I think it's pretty good. And my client likes it. And uh, I got a picture for scale there. Uh, I had gone with a client to church because they have a magnificent uh, cathedral uh, organ there at the Episcopal Cathedral. So I was dressed up because we'd gone to church. So, Which, uh, city Scranton, Pennsylvania. Scranton, Pennsylvania. I don't know. They just restored it recently. Um, now, there's my dad. This is hand-laid composition. And this is what a lot of my clients like because it looks like it's just carved out of the ceiling. Um, I found that design in an old book and come to find out it was originally in the decorator supply catalog. It is not exact perfect replica, but it's very close to what we had found. And uh, the folks at decorator were real excited to see us kind of replicate something that uh, they had designed or someone had designed 100 plus years ago came out with it's getting its painting and its faux finishing work done. Um, normally when I uh, create a sketch or something, I'll start with something like this and then refine it a little bit and come up with a working drawing. A lot of times I'll throw out lots of different ideas to see what the client's going to want. I had one lady, she had flower bouquets all over her house. I put together all these designs of flowers and she said, I hate flowers. <laughs> so. She was a manager of a BMW dealership, and uh, she was a tough, tough lady. But I was just like, man, you got more flowers here than I've ever seen. And, and, and part of classical ornament is often beautiful flowers. Um, this is a process. I did this house in Austin, a house in Austin last year, and the client wanted a hand-laid ceiling, so we bought the compo. We made, I hand-laid the centerpiece to make a plaster cast. Um, I get the pieces, I take them out of the box, I lay them on a piece of paper, get them looking the way I want before I go there, and then I trace around them. And after I trace them, that's what it looked like on the table. When I trace it, then I put the tracing up on the ceiling, use my pencil, and I trace it onto the ceiling. And then that gives me the guide, and I'm able to apply the ornamentation to the ceiling. And, I just use plain old paper and I draw on one side and I flip it over and I draw on the back side and carbon paper. I started with that and I've even done the pounce methods with the wheels and I find you just draw on, draw the original, flip it over, draw over it a few times and you've got enough graphite up there to do something with it. And then of course when I apply it to wood, compo does not need a nail, it, it bonds to wood like you would not believe. But when I put it on a painted ceiling, the only thing holding it to that ceiling is the layer of paint. And we always, always put brads into our ornamentation. We never want to fall and hurt someone or anything. This is a house in Bryan, Texas. It's a very large home there. And uh, it was a French room. We actually, they contacted us, said we want us to design this room. I designed the room. They ordered all the material. Uh, we showed up, and the house wasn't didn't even have drywall up. It was still in the steel, literally the steel framing stages. They had a few rooms done. They had about a quarter of a million dollars worth of ornaments sitting in boxes that was going to be installed. They didn't know what to do with it either. Um, I said, well, I can't guarantee that I can come back in a couple of years and do all this work for you. So they just hired us. And we spent two years in that house and did just about every room in the house. and. There. That's what the dining room came out like. This is in Brian. That's in Brian. <laughs> mm -hmm. 40,000 square foot French chateau. It's right next to the Miramont Country Club, which is owned by the owner. Uh, he's a big bank owner up there. Uh, wonderful man. He's the only person who ever sent me an engraved thank you, a stationary thank you note. 
wonderful people and he's in his late 80s now i believe but uh, i don't have any other pictures there are other rooms that are just as spectacular um he has uh, seven at the time this was 20 years ago um, they had frenchmen bring uh, a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar ormolu chandelier for the lo for the lobby and a three hundred thousand dollar ormolu chandelier for the dining room and he found out that i took a picture of them and he wasn't very happy with me so a lot of times people are kind of funny and, and I can take pictures of the work that I'm doing, but I've tried and tried to get back and see the house and I've never been able to get in. Uh, I did a little bit of work at the country club too, but it was more commercial. Um, a bedroom, that's all hand laid composition ornament. It was supposed to have been a little more ornate, but they scaled it back a little bit. Yes, yes. The, uh, the interior designer, this is in Rogers, Arkansas. You know, after Sam Walton died, everybody started uh, spending their money that they had been. This was actually Red Hudson of Hudson Foods. He has since passed away, so I'll tell you his name. Uh, he built quite a big house. He was 84 years old at the time he built this house. Uh, that is the living room. And you can see the ornamental work we did up in the ceiling. We did several, quite a few rooms in this house. It's a beautiful house. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, this is decorator supply, composition ornament, gilded, and that's the big dome there. And that's all mahogany that they brought in from South America. That house has got more mahogany in it than I think any house in America. Um, so when I do a design a plaster ceiling, um, I create knives, and there's a knife sitting over there on the table. I'm not going to walk over and pick it up now, but basically I create a shape. I draw it on paper. We come, come up with a design I want. I transfer it. to I like to use manila folders. I take that. I cut that out. I mount that on a piece of tin, and then I like to spray paint it, and I pull it off, and that leaves my pattern. Then I take my nibblers and my little cutting scissors, metal shears, and I cut the shape out, and I sand it, and I polish it, and I get it looking right. And then I set up my, my bench work on my tables, and I'll show you a, a little picture of that a little bit later. But then I create those shapes, which, um, and sometimes if we're doing a lot, we'll mold it. I think all this stuff I just ran from, I ran, just kept running pieces over and over and over. I'll put styrofoam under it so that it's not thick full of plaster. It's just thin, fine. Then I can tear the styrofoam out and just have the plaster work there. But that is the basic forms of the ceiling. Then I come back and I put the composition ornament on top of it. And that's when it starts to come to life. And then I get good old Jerry to start faux finishing it and gilding it. And uh, it really looks beautiful. He uses real gold leaf. I don't like I don't like Dutch metals because even though you can seal them, they tarnish, and after a few years, they just start to turn blue and green. And um, and I prefer oil-based size because it's, it stays hard. Where the water sizes will just be soft, and they never seem to dry right. But I thought he's still under still working on it there. But I thought that's one of my favorite ceilings, and I just, I just love that room. I just really love that. Um, they do. They do. <laughs> can lights, that's another pet peeve of mine, can lights. Um, actually, when I did the house in Bryan, it's got more can lights in that dining room ceiling than I had ever seen. And I kind of made a sarcastic remark to the interior designer about, I really love those can lights. Well, the lighting designer came down from Dallas, and he introduced me to her, and he says, Thomas really loves your can lights. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I was, oh. Yeah, um, when I do a lot of early sketches, this was done for a house in California. I would send her the stuff. She would never email me back. I'd contact her. Oh, I haven't, hadn't had a chance to look at that yet. Months and months go by, and I sent her several sketches. But that's the one she chose, but then she never followed up with me to finish it. But I usually start with a sketch like that, and then I go... I look at what's available. How do I want to do it? Um, some of the plaster companies, they create everything from scratch. I'm... 
I'm a, like I said, I'm a kit basher. I work with what I've got, and I know that the decorator products are going to work. This is the medallion that is in the house in Bryan, Texas. Uh, it's also in about five other houses around the country because people like this medallion. Its uh, centerpiece is six feet, and with all the enrichments, it comes out to about 10 feet in diameter. That was all leftover ornament. We had done the room. We did not have any medallions. Client says, I want some medallions. So I went all out, and I gave him some medallions. And that's a picture of the medallion. I was a little bit younger back then, a lot skinnier, too. And uh, yep, that's, uh, that's what it looks like in a finished house. That right there is two-story. The other, the other room was, I believe it was 14 or 16, yeah, that living room. That was actually in that house we saw the living room at. Um, and then, come on, come on. Am I doing something wrong? There. And that's the crown. Oops, went too far. That's the crown. Went too far. Go back. There. Uh, that's the crown molding that's, that you just saw on that ceiling. The sample of it's out here on the table here, so you can see how big it really, really is. Um, this is also the house in Rogers, Arkansas. You can see in its raw and its finished state. Um, this was the very first really large ceiling I had ever done on a really grand scale. I, um, I did a home show back in the early 90s. An interior designer walked in 10 minutes before the show started, handed me a card and said, I'm a Vander Holyfield's designer. Uh, I want to meet with you next week. And I started laying out all these ceilings for Evander's big house in uh, south of Atlanta. I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I really had no idea. how. I knew how to put compo on a wall, but I did not know how to create a big plaster ceiling because we evolved. We started hand laying compo. Then we said, well, now we need to install um, plaster. Then it was like, well, we need to make plaster. Well, we, now we need to do this. Now we need, and we kept growing. And then they'd say, well, who's going to paint this for me? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? And pretty soon I was learning how to do everything. But uh, that is one of my favorite ceilings. This is one of the first ones I ever did, and uh, it is one of my favorite ceilings. This is in Atlanta. This is a, that crown molding is five and a half feet tall. We created the corbels from scratch, the swags from scratch, and um, the stair hall came out fabulous. It's so hard to photograph these things. And of course, the architects photographed this because it's in their books and all that, uh, on their portfolios and everything. This is what I call my piece de resistance. This is my favorite ceiling. It was the hardest ceiling, but I think it's the most beautiful. That's my dad there with one of our employees. Uh, from the bottom of that circle to the ceiling is over 24 inches tall. The room is about 20, 20 feet wide by 40 feet long. That's what it looked like after we had finished the installation. And that's what it looked like when it was finished. That's in Atlanta, in Buckhead. Um, it's actually, it's not drywall, it is plaster. Those are actual plaster. That's a steel frame building and the plaster was put up on mesh. So it's, it's actual lath plaster. A fellow named John Davenport from England did all the plaster work and uh, he really knows his stuff. He and I worked together for many years. Uh, he's gone up to New York City now. Um, the pieces, most of those pieces, we actually, this particular job, we have metal anchors that we inserted up and they're stuck into the lath above the ceiling because we really didn't have anything we could screw into. So, and to give you a sense of scale, all the, the four medallions, they're, they're 36 inches wide. But uh, it, uh, Uh, the, there is no center medallion. That's the chandelier. That's the chandelier. Yeah, I don't know about. That's just the chandelier. So we'll go back and see. Chandelier. So, but yeah, I've got to get it. But uh, yeah, that was a very, very exciting project. I'm not here just to show you my portfolio. I want to tell you about the things that I've done and how we do it too a little bit. I did over 24 home theaters. This was probably one of my better ones. Uh, back in the 90s, home theaters were the thing and we had a lot of requests. Those, 
those new new subdivisions in North Atlanta, St. Marlowe, all, you know, all had fancy French names. Everybody had to have a home theater in their basement. So uh, we did lots and lots of home theaters. I don't like the, the painting in there. My friend actually did that painting, but it's a little bit loud and purple and green for me. But uh, the clients loved it, and uh, it came out well. Restoration work again, big capitals. These are the Carnegie Library capitals and Bryan. They got one half down, everything else crumbled because it was basically held together by paint. We had to wear white suits, plastic Tyvek suits with masks for days trying to get all the pigeon remains out of it and spraying it with Clorox and killing all the diseases and the germs before we could ever work it. And it, it had a lot of damage, had to rebuild a lot of it and uh, poured a big mold there and uh, fell over and crushed my knee with that mold. But uh, no injuries except a little pain. Okay, uh, this is my little shop here at my house over here off of Phelan. Um, this is the actual piece right here that I ran that piece with. This is called a horse. Like I said, I take the, I take the, I create the design, I cut it out of the tin, and then we call this part the knife after it's cut. And then I build this part here, which is the horse. And then this runs along the edge of the table, and I start piling up wet plaster, and then I run it through. And see, I, and that's probably half the buckets that I used right there. But I mix it up, and it, I set them to go off at different intervals. And I hope that I can stay ahead of it, because when it gets hard and starts hardening, then it will chatter, and it will just ju 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 Because plaster expands as it is uh, heating up and then going into the cooling mode. And you spray a lot of water on it, but uh, that was a piece that I did here this past summer. And this is, and I've had these that were, you know, this big before. So, um, lots of those. That's basically how you do that. And then also the same principle applies for a ceiling medallion. You just accept instead of running it down the table, you have a pivot and you build that plaster up. And then I go back with the ornamentation and I decorate it then I can mold it and make as many copies as, as I need to. This is a piece that I did for a client here in Beaumont this past summer. There is a, this is a the clay piece, this, uh, this piece existed in their house and I went and I made mold of it and then I poured it in clay and I kind of cleaned it up and made it because it had so many, this, this is the original molding, it has the paint, so many layers of paint, it's washed out. So I went back in and cleaned it all out and made it more detailed and then uh, we created a crown molding. And that's a little six inch by six inch uh, crown molding in one of their children's bedrooms. And then, um, nope, nope, not too far. Some of y'all may know the fellow that owns this house. Uh, my friend Dean sitting over here came to me several years ago with um, this brackets that he had got, corbels that he had gotten in um, Louisiana. Was it a plantation in Louisiana? Okay. Okay. So I uh, cleaned it all up, restored it, and made copies for him and he was able to put them on his house and every time I drive through there on my way over to college I'm always excited to see those corbels on his beautiful home and then uh, this is my most recent project this is the pipe work case a pipe case uh, the case organ case for the um, I don't know it's a Catholic cathedral in Memphis and we're in the very early stages of that it's 40 feet wide it'll all be wood covered in ornamentation but they've got to raise about three million dollars to build it so we have the organ we have the pipes we just uh tom helms who, who restored the jefferson organ brought me in on this one so we're kind of working on that and uh i just want to touch lightly i don't know what the future of ornament is i don't know what generations are going to do it we have a problem in america we don't have trades anymore we have lost good craftsmen um this was David Easterly. He passed away three years ago. 
uh, he is probably, he's the one who studied Grinling Gibbons the most and really replicated his, his quality of his work. Unfortunately, most of these great artisans, it takes a lifetime to become a great artisan, and most of the really great ones we have now are, you know, up in, up in their years. This is Alexander Grabovyatsky, I think his name is. He was Russian, uh, came after the, uh, the wall came down. Um, he is one of the premier carvers in America now and a really nice guy, and I, I want to go meet him. I, won't, I don't want to study with him how to carve. I want to learn how he creates the designs because you can just see the thought process that he put into that, that carving right there. That's what I want to learn from him. And then another man I admire greatly is Jeffrey Preston, and I have followed his work for years. He is, I think, the finest sculptor in the world right now. He also does something very unique. He does a form of parge where he actually puts the plaster on and he sculpts it too. He puts a little animal hide glue in it that keeps it from retarding as fast and he sculpts. But the quality of his work is just fabulous. It's nothing like uh, anything that I can do. And the compo was good, but his work is just amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So I think, oh, glad, glad I put that in the slide. If you've been in the McFadden Ward house, you're familiar with the pink parlor, as you called it. Yes. Well, uh, the first time I went over there, we, uh, Tom Bell brought us over. I'm on the board at Beaumont Main Street, and we'd come over here and done a little tour. And I went in there, and I said, oh, that's decorator supply ornament. I just recognize it because um, I kind of, Jack kind of lovingly refers me to me as the most knowledgeable person on decorator supply ornament in the world because I know the book inside and out. And uh, so I called Jack and said, would you donate a piece so that I could do this presentation with? And this is the top piece that is found in, I could have replicated the whole thing, but he wasn't gonna pay for all that. But he did send us one piece and we're gonna leave that with the museum. But this, this is a, a very fresh piece of composition ornament. And if I was to apply it, I would put it on my steam table and it would become very soft and pliable. And then I could apply it to the wall, I could bend it, I can do whatever I want to with it. But there is just a little tie-in of history and that's, that's why I promote the Decorator Supply Company because I love working with them and I love their products and we just have had a great relationship. So I hope I haven't bored you. I hope you've learned a little something and I just wanna thank you for coming and hopefully I shared a little something with you. I love doing it, it's a lot of fun. No, if you're using fresh ornament, it's very soft. And I use the 23 gauge brads, pop it right through and it's fine. Don't even really have to point them out when you're done. If it's stale ornament and the glues have kind of already hardened, yeah, you'll have to drill a hole. Before you begin the work in the house, does, it, does the house or doing the acclimating? I'm usually one of the last people into the house after the drywall or the, sh or the plaster goes up. I'm usually fighting with the floor guys. That's kind of the stage where I'm, I'm in. Before the painters and, and the fun, but most of the trim is usually in or if we're doing the trim or wh whoever. We're kind of that final stage before the floors and the final painting. Yes, sir? I have not. I've watched a lot of videos. My friend here just has got a, a CNC machine on the way, and I'm like, uh, I'm going to learn a little more about that. I've been wanting one for years, but my wife would never let me buy one yet. <laughs> but uh, the, I have discussed with, with uh, the, the owners of Decorator. We've talked about 3D printing, and, um, of course, we don't have the sculptors anymore. Um, and, and another thing is we live in a more modern world. That's 
I had a talk with an interior designer one time, and he was he wasn't happy with my work because it wasn't true to the period. And I explained that I design ceilings for modern American houses. I'm not doing a Louis the Fourteenth or a. I'm designing something that will look beautiful in that particular house. And I try to play off the periods, but I can't be. I'm not trained to be a purist. But um, yeah. Uh, I think with the lack of tradespeople, uh, we're seeing more of the plastics like the flexible urethanes and things that are easy to install. So I, I think we'll see more and more of that in the future. Can you say more about what you've done in downtown Beaumont? What I have done in downtown Beaumont, um, I work for the city now. I've been there six years. I, uh, after my dad retired, it was hard to do it all because he was our installer. I was the designer. I would assist him. Uh, on the job sites, and uh, my wife was a school teacher, and she went back to school to become a mental health counselor, and we needed some insurance. So I took a job with the city, and the work I've done with the city, primarily the restoration of the Jefferson Theater ceilings. We've done two, two batches of that, and then we last year we did the tuck pointing of the walls of the east and south facades to keep the water out. During uh, Hurricane Harvey, the water just flooded into that building and destroyed the organ chamber, the main chamber where the pipe organs were and the ceiling fell. So we're trying to waterproof that building, which it, it's just a constant battle. The older these buildings get, the harder they are to take care of. Um, the only other work I've done in downtown here is I did some restoration work at the Westminster Church when they were converting it into that school. I think it's Veritas Academy or something. Um, I went and restored some of the plaster work there for them. Yes, ma'am? Is this the chandelier in the Jefferson? The large chandelier? Is it the it's Oh, no. That's a, that's a plaster medallion. It, it's, it's all secured up there. It's, it's never going to go anywhere. No. It is. Those, those, those faces you see up there are about this big. They really are. Yes, ma'am? Uh, love. <laughs> I, I, um, I had been divorced for 12 years and um, met my wife online, actually. And we dated for about four years. And at the time, I, I, I have a catalog here from my company. I bought the Plasticraft Company out of Dallas in 1999. Um, trying to get us off of scaffolding in more of a manufacturing situation, which it never really worked. We're really better at doing custom work. And I sold the company in 2007, and that let me move to Texas. I had no plans to move to Texas, but my teenage kids weren't talking to me much at that time. One of them actually came out here with me. Um, but uh, that's how I came here. And I spent... Um, several years just sort of freelancing with Milton Bell, the architect. He and my father-in-law, Fred Brown, were very uh, good friends. Uh, my father-in-law worked for the Rogers Brothers for about 40 years in doing their finances. So um, he was, you know, in his late 80s at the time, and he had let go of his staff, but he didn't want to leave. I needed an office, so I would come up there, and we would do his projects, and we would do my projects, and when I would go to install, I would disappear for a month or six weeks and come back. So um, that's kind of about 2012 is when I kind of ramped down to more of a part-time. And now I'm very part-time. You just, you just have to hit me at the right moment to see what, if I want to do it or not. I generally will stay within about six hours of, of Beaumont. So I go to Dallas sometimes, Austin, San Antonio, Meridian, Mississippi. Uh, but yes, yes, I will not take a project. I actually took one this summer here in town that was really too big for me to do. I just, uh, I think if I'd had this, I manufactured it all myself and installed it all by myself, and I underestimated. I forgot that I'm not a kid anymore doing this full time. I still have a day job now, so. The, the bank and the photographs? Oh, 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 the one across from, what do you call it? The one that's across the street from the 470 building, the original National Bank. 
No, across the street from that one. It's on the corner, 470, and then the new bank, and it's the one there on the corner that's in disrepair. Thank you so 